Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of wellness titles and originals, like The Light Podcast by Michelle Obama, Work It Out by Mel Robbins, and Confidence Gap by Russ Harris. Membership includes access to Audible originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash motivation or text motivation to 500-500. That's audible.com slash motivation or text motivation to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. The weather is cooling down a bit. The leaves are starting to fall. Yes, it's that time of year again. Football season. And we all know the best part of any game day traditions are the ones that involve food. There's nothing like having everyone in your game day crew coming together to bring their best bites and argue over whose family makes the best chili. And while there's no need to mess with the perfection of game day classics, like a freshly grilled Oscar Mayer hot dog topped with Heinz ketchup and mustard, it's always fun to step out of your comfort zone and get creative with your recipes. Because there's nothing more fun than adding to your list of game day traditions, like making a creamy and delectable queso dip with Velveeta cheese that can be eaten with so much more than just chips. Now is the chance for people across the nation to find out whose game day eats reign supreme. It's your turn to show off your tasty game day food traditions. Go to www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to share a photo of your game day food tradition to enter to win $10,000. Once again, that's www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to enter to win $10,000. This is Full Change with Tom Laidlaw. Hey, lad. We bonnie lad you. That's my Irish impression right there. We we bonnie lad. You said, you said, small pretty boy. We. Swell, Alice. Oh, come on, bitch. No, no, that's That's not. No, out. What is it? Meatheads. How do you call yourself? Meatheads? Meat and meatheads? Mudheads? Sometimes it's mudheads. It does. So you uh, you had the COVID, Tom? You're feeling better now? I am. I don't think you really cared, though. I know. I like. Yeah. Like, I, did you ever ask me? How it no, not at all. Yeah, I did. I did. Well, it's funny, some of my old teammates, uh, you know, they knew I had COVID, but they were more like we had this golf event, and they wanted me to drive them around, like be a chauffeur and stay here, like a hotel. Right. And I got COVID, and they're complaining, you know, "What's going on?" I said, "Well, I've got COVID." Well, you know, deadly. Well, no, not anymore. It's a bad cold. Is what it is, and it's it, it, it's rough. Colds are rough. Well, then again. I go to the gym by myself, so I'm continuing to go to the gym and posted videos online. Yeah, I get touching everything, sweating out things. But they're all like, "Oh, you went to the gym?" Well, yeah, but like, I, I, I'm not a baby. I don't sit around and whine about it. Like some, some of these old uh, retired hockey players that turn into a bunch of old women. Wait, it's not even fair to old women. I apologize. Yes. That's, that's bad Wait, so you mean that some kind of previously narcissistic people who had everything handed to them turned into old whining people? Old, really? Old narcissistic? No, oh, we could see that, Shambri. Move on, though. Yeah, like some guys are living in the past, like they're still playing in the national hockey. They expect everybody to do it. Well, yeah, that's fair. But I mean, you, uh, you know, I've seen you in, in in public with people, and you're pretty good. You're you're pretty good with pretty good. All right, sorry, I'll take it. You're very good. You're very charming with with fans. Charming and charismatic is what I'm told. Yes, you're definitely charismatic. They don't know who you are half the time. I know it's fine. <laughs> they don't remember the hockey career. They remember Survivor. They're right. Yeah. Just say after third Maloney, bro. Oh, that it was true. Yeah, that is funny because I do go to events sometimes, and, and people remember that I played obviously because of the Ranger events. But they always want to talk about Swiver. They don't talk about any goals I scored. Well, they, they, they could talk about 25, and then it'd be done, right? You could have a list. 25 end to end rushes. That's no, how I remember. No, no, no. I don't think there's a single end to end rush on YouTube of Tom Layla. Have you ever had an end to end rush? Uh, well, I mean, my whole life. I had the breakaway one time. Uh, Madison Square Garden, we were playing Pittsburgh, came out with a penalty box, and I had a breakaway. I was so nervous I was going to miss that shot of radio interest. Yeah. Did you shoot from the blue line? Or did you? <laughs> I went in a little bit. But not that bad. Do you have any moves? Like, do you have any? Well, uh, here's the thing. So I've told the story before when Herb Brooks was coaching, he wanted me to get rid of the puck right away. Right. We were killing Pelly out there we're in Washington. From my third or fourth year in the league, I'm feeling pretty good about my game. And I had plenty of chance to shoot the puck down the ice, which I should have done. I decided I was going to do a little toe drag and go around. Like, it worked out fine. I heard that from Brooks screamed, hey, don't do that again. We, we, our listeners have never heard that story. Well, what if it's a new listener? He said, well, what is the story, Tom? That's a good point. Yeah. So for all our 
for our current listeners, we apologize, but for new listeners, there's a story. Tom, yeah, dangle. Yeah, I'm reinforcing the story. Is what it is. And the key thing is they tell the story the same way so people think, okay, it's a, it's a legitimate story. That's that's a really fair point you do. You say it exactly the same way, almost like it's yeah. verbatim. Yeah. Head. Cool. So Tommy dangles back in the 80s with the, with the puck, and then her books put us, he put that to that. He squelched. Oh, he yelled at me like, you ever do that again? I'm going to sit you on the bench. And he's like, F- wow. F- 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 I'm thinking myself, it hurt. It's a, it's a move, right? But he, what he didn't want to ha- start happening was that I was going to have that stuff. It's funny, we talk about uh, my uh, guy coach with his son, does it? He, he always says his son doesn't really skate hard, but because uh, they're seven and, and eight years old, but his son always finds a way to score. I was like, and this is just teaching him he doesn't have to skate hard. He's like, I don't know what I got to do here. So, Andy, yeah, uh, tell, tell uh, Connor, you know, to use the Herb Brooks treatment on him. But you know what, though? I, like, it wasn't until I got, like, what was it, 15 or 16 years old, where I really got much more of a work ethic. I worked okay, but my junior coach, I pulled this story many yeah. times too. Uh, he started getting on me about working harder, like especially going back to get the puck. So I, I when people say that about the kids, there's a certain point for kids where if they're really going to make it, that's that switch kind of goes off, right? Sure. And but I, I and well, I was going to say it's up to the player. Ultimately, it was up to me to do it. The coach was really forcing me to do it. But uh, you don't strike me though as someone who didn't work hard, though. Well, yeah, you know that's that's true. It's just uh, I think he saw something in my game that if I was going to make it, I had to know. Especially on the breakouts, that was going to be a key part of my game, right? And it was in the national hockey because that uh, even more important now, where defense, some of the best defense is getting the puck out of your zone sure. quickly, right? Then that's really became the staple. Uh, it's funny though, because so at the end of my career, I hurt my back, so they sent me down to the minors uh, uh, for about uh, four games or something. And now I'm not criticizing the minor league players, but they're not NHL players, right? So I got so used to the NHL where I, it was just automatic. I'd go back, get the puck, and hardly even look, just fired right up to the hash marks guy's going to be there that's in the right hockey league play. so i get to the miners i did that the first time there's nobody there no, no, no that yeah <laughs> and, they're all, and they're all looking at me like what time did you did you play in the nhl i was like well yeah <laughs> it, it, it was tougher to play in the miners than it where was, was yeah. well uh, what i remember from your career is you, you i think you were the, very good in front of that cross checking yeah. check people i don't you're a decent passer yeah uh i don't think you had any kind of shot at all oh a terrible shot okay yeah. terrible I, I fired one one time i actually saw a video of it recently and I'm like, I remember thinking when I did it, it's like, well, that, that well, they heard it. <laughs> I should bottle that. We're in college, my coach, we had a re- really good player, this Jeff Taskoff, smaller guy, great golfer. So he had the really good swing yep. and everything. So Rick Conley, our coach, uh, Coach Conley, uh, one day at practice, he brings uh, Jeff Taskoff over. He says, okay, show him how to show Layla how to shoot. Show him okay. how to shoot. So we start doing it for a few minutes. And back then, I was even nuttier than, than ever. And uh, we did it for a few minutes. I got so frustrated because I couldn't do it. I was going nuts. The coach, Oh, really? up away. Oh, yeah, I'd lose my mind. See, that that was part of the thing when I was that age, like in college. If something didn't go right, somebody yeah, was going to pay right. right. Yeah, you thought you could beat up Muhammad Ali. Oh, yeah. Head. Oh, yeah. But, but that's why, maybe that's why you're a terrible golfer, too. Because you just yeah, don't have no, that. No patience. I don't have the swing. I've got the Charles Barkley swing. You know, the one. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Terrible. And then I just I have no joy of the game. That's what I All right. So, no shot. Yep. Decent skater. This is the, the scouting report on, on top. I, I was a pretty good passer. I was above average okay. passer. Good passer. Passer. That was, yeah. You're very good in front of the net. Yep. You're very dependable defensively. Right. Good team player. Good team player. Yeah. Players player a couple times. Yeah. The horrible prankster in the locker room. Yeah. Yeah. Borderline bully. Maybe. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, like the emotional bully, yes. Did you guys have the psych test back then when you got trapped? Or is that the, the, the newer thing? We had the beer test. I'm very right. sure. beer. So, so no, no. Did they didn't even, did the Rangers even talk to you before they drafted you? Uh, no. No, they didn't. So they just picked you without That's one right. visit, what, without yeah. one, nothing. Never met anybody. Uh, yeah, no, I can tell a story about his stall. Yeah. We're not if somebody is no. watching the show or listening to the show for the first time. Doing the stuff. Oh, I'll be brief. Go back and listen. Working at a horse farm, not your dad's horse farm, a different horse farm. Horse farm. They called my dad. Yeah. He called me up. Well, has what? Uh, no, no. For somebody that has not listened to the show okay. before, fair enough. Right. I'm sitting riveted on the side of the show. Okay. Right. Now. Okay. Riveted, riveted. Go for it. All right. Yeah, great, great work. That's a great work. Riveted. So go ahead. No, it's so it's. it's, it's I'll, I'll share the words. So they, my father calls me up at the horse farm. He says you've been drafted by the Rangers. He just call. I said, "What do I do now?" Wait, why don't wait? Hold on, let's go back. Why don't I? I'd be. I'll play the role of your dad. You play the role of young Tom Laidlaw. Okay. Your dad's probably got a Canadian accent, right? Get out, eh? Yeah. Okay. Get out, eh? So, uh, hey, Tom, I just got a call from the uh, New York Rangers. There. What? What? What they want? Holy, yeah. you just got drafted in the uh, the sixth round there, Tom. What do I do now, Dad? Well, you go back in the the stall and you shovel the shit. <laughs> What's your idea? Right, there we go. <laughs> that was my. Well, it's hilarious because more like especially now when I agent business for 22 years and taking kids to the draft the comparisons because now everybody you go there for the weekend there's all these interviews and everything you got the suits on the family's all there it's a whole you're shoveling manure 
And that listen, that's great. That's humbling. And that, but it's it's just amazing to me that even though that was only what 80, 81, they just seventy eight. I guess after, yeah. but they didn't even contact me. Yeah. Once, and then even after that, I finally had to call them months later to say, "What do I do?" And they were kind of like mad at me. Reading, what do you do? Get back up there and play. So how the hell were they scouting back then? There's no videotape, right? Like, what are they sending? Well, they, to? they would have somebody come watch me. You're probably not going out to Marquette, but we played down like a Bowling Green, Ohio State, those kind of places. So they send scouts to watch a few players in the game, and then they say, okay, they make their notes, and that's how you got drafted. Yeah, yeah, back then. And, you know, and looking back at it, I know the draft is a big thing now, but sometimes it's like, but right now for a lot of players, it's born over proportion. So all these sure. players that are drafted don't make the national hire. Right. And there's this perception that you're drafted, so they're going to play in the NHL. It's just not true. There's a, like the numbers are well oh, below fifty. percent Oh yeah, it's it, yeah. and it gets and the ones who have longer careers. It's even it's even smaller. Yeah, totally it's crazy. But you they, look, they got right on you. They picked in the sixth round, which is a late round pick, and you had an eleven year career. So yeah. they got that one right. There's other ones they didn't get right. Yeah, you know what I think is too. It's a lot of it is development after after you're drafted. It's like the stuff you've done before. Okay, that determines where you're drafted. Uh, again, is, is that luck for me going up to Northern Michigan where I was captain all the time, playing all the time? I, I've said this so many times, my father, grandfather, the work ethic, I, and the good thing, the way the Rangers handled it was that it was just, there was no promises or anything like that. I just figured, okay, I just got to get to work. Show them work hard. But you, you also, one thing that happens is you didn't shrink. When you, when you first went to Peterborough, you shrank. You're like, I can't do this. Oh, 15, yeah. I can't do it. When you got to New York, you yeah. said, I can do this. Yes. You ran Phil Esposito, you made yeah. the team and you, you said, this is, I can do this. So yeah. That's the difference. I think a lot of time. Yeah. That growing up period of college, you know, was huge for me. The, the decision, I didn't know what I was doing. My parents didn't know what we were doing, but the way it worked out was that for sure I went there's for sure that hockey team. So now I'm not playing behind any upper class. Right. And again, all, even all the things socially that got off the ice, I told them sort about knocking on the door. You know, it's like all those little learning moments, uh, my senior year, making a speech in front of the team. Yep. That was a huge moment for me. So, so much happened to me in the four years of college that prepared me to come and play for the right. I, but, but again, even still, that did happen, help you develop, but you got to New York and you met the moment yep. and you were there for the other guys get there and they don't, they shrink from it. Yeah. And you, you did. So I don't, I hate to give you compliments because you give yourself enough, but you, yeah, you met, you made it, you made it work. Very true too. Yeah. Cause it wasn't, uh, and you know me and I don't know if that's a good trait or a bad trait. I just didn't think too much. I just knew, okay, I'm going to show up. Well, and another good thing was my, after my senior year going to New Haven and now getting my feet in the little things, right. Yeah. So now I go back up to Marquette, Michigan, and just work my rear end up, running up hills and everything. So I knew when I got to camp, I needed to be, I need to be bigger, stronger. Cause I realized once I got there, these are men who play. Yeah. Now, these are yeah. yeah. It's a different level. And that, and you got that cup of coffee after college, you went to New Haven and played the playoffs with our next guest, yes. goaltender, Steve Baker. Yes. Mr. Baker, funny guy. And he's a really intelligent, it's great to see him again. Because <laughs> we were such buttheads back yes. there, right? Uh, but he's, he was this intelligent guy with the union that, uh, and I was really impressed too. I didn't realize I hadn't spoken to him in a long time that he went back to school after his career yep. was done and uh, it's been really successful. People are going to, people going to love this interview with Steve Baker, who had a great iconic mask for the ring. That's right. Too. Great job. Hey Tom, uh, these shows are great because we have another one of your former teammates on. We have a goaltender you played with for a few years and someone who had one of the coolest masks in Ranger goalie history. We have Steve Baker on the show today. Bakes, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great, Tommy. It's always good to be with you. It's been a long time. It has, too. Yeah, so he's always, uh, Steve was always one of these guys that we were all mutt head hockey players and he was this intelligent guy amongst all these idiots. So uh, I've always, always remembered you. Well, I don't know about that. We all have stories. We all have stories. So we, we talked about this uh, before the show, but I have to tell this, this story. Uh, my father, we had a farm, sold the farm, he became a firefighter. Uh, and he ultimately was a chief. So when the parents would come in, uh, they, the fathers in particular come in the locker room, ride play land, the practice ring, everybody would introduce the fathers as, you know, Don Laidlaw or what was it. You got there and your father, and rightfully so, was a, a doctor, he was a dentist. You called him Dr. Baker. That's how you introduced him. That's the way he was supposed to be. But us smuthead hockey players decided we we're going to take that now. And every father that came in, we now introduce him by his career, his profession. So my father now was Chief Laidlaw. I think Mike Rogers, I can't remember for sure, was a cardboard coffin maker, I think. So he would introduce him as cardboard coffin maker Laidlaw. She's a Roger. Or Roger, sorry. So I, I, I've always wanted to tell you that story. It's been years since I've seen you. Uh, so I, and I lovingly called my father Chief for the rest of his life. Um, and uh, that's just how he became. That was all because of you. So. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. That's good. No, I listen. Uh, we used to call my dad Doc Baker. Everybody knew him as Doc Baker. Oh, okay. For whatever reason that day, I said yeah. Doctor Baker, and you know what? Vad never let me off the hook on oh, one. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. Time. Oh. You know, what are you doing? Saying your dad's a doctor. What's his name? His name's Mike or Tom or Brandon or Billy or whatever it is. You know, that's when he introduced your dad. I'm like, hey, sorry, man. 
you know, funny, like us, we were some, such muttheads, right? Like you're doing the right thing, the professional thing. Your dad is a doctor, so he introduced was doctors. Yeah, no, I grew up in the Boston area. So, you know, for me, very impressionable with, with baseball and war yeah. and big, bad Bruins. And, you know, I was, you know, eight, nine, 10 year old kid at the time when they were winning. And it's like, man, I want to be part of this. I, w- I want to do this. And rings started popping up all over the place in the Boston area. And I got the Joneses and uh, it all went from there. Wow, that's cool. Now, you're a goaltender you started? I was, yeah. I had, you know, like I, I, we were sharing, you know, earlier, I had uh, five brothers and two sisters. So a big brood at the house and uh, my older brothers needed a target and I got elected. You know? <laughs> were you pretty good right away? Uh, you know, I, I was, um, I, I started as a catcher in baseball and I just love those tools, right? I love the, in, in, in baseball, they always said the tools of ignorance, the catcher, right? Sure. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I just, I loved having the gear on. I loved to be, being kind of the, uh, the guy who was seeing it all, seeing it all develop and being in charge of that regard. And yeah, I actually had some good success right from the get go. You know, once you figured out the skate piece and learned how to skate, uh, it all took off from there. Yeah. I watched an old video. I knew you were going to be on the show, so I watched an old video of one of our games. I think it was a playoff game. Uh, St. Louis, that first, my first year, 81, you were in that, right? Yeah, that was uh, Yeah, that was a good run by you and the team, right? That was that was pretty cool. And I'm, I thought to myself, you looked like Ken Dryden out there, right? You're that tall guy that's bent over, good glove hand, right? That was your, like you talk now, that was your probably one of your strikes, right? Was your glove hand. Cool. Yeah. cool. Well, uh, Dryden was like one of my idols, right? Like we both played for the same college coach, Ned Harkness, uh, all of them were. And Harkness had him at Cornell back in the day, and then he had me at Union when we built that program out. And uh, so I always looked up to Ken. Fortunately, I had a chance to you know meet him a few times and chat with him. Right. So uh, yeah, he was he was a great one. I wish about my career I'd stayed healthy and was able to realize a little bit more uh, excitement at the other end of it. Well, I, I'd forgotten about those that first year and the run you had. Uh, you know, again the team had a good run, but you were playing fantastic too. Yeah, you were uh, you were on the road to doing the same kind of stuff. Um, so you, you grew up, at, do you, so you didn't play junior hockey or anything like that. You went right to college. No, I went to college. Yeah, right out of uh, right out of high school. Played in the Catholic Conference in the Boston area, which, you know, it, that was the rage back in the day. Uh, now it's all private prep schools. But, um, you know, went from Archbishop Williams right to Union with Harkness. And, um, and we built a program from start. We had an all-freshman varsity there playing an independent schedule. I think over the two and a half years that I was there, I think we only lost about maybe five games. So we had a pretty, we had a pretty good wagon. We took the UNH down when they were loaded uh, with Rod Langway and Bobby Miller and just Ralph Cox and a number of great talent. We took them down, I think, 8-4 in our building. Wow. We were ranked number one in the country. So, yeah, we had a pretty good program. We ended up going pretty good there. So you started the program. So when I went to Northern Michigan, it was the same thing. My first year was, uh, my freshman year was first year that I had a hockey team there. So that was cool. I thought that was uh, one of the keys for me because I, I didn't have to sit behind any upperclassmen and play. I just played all the time. I'm sure the same for you too. Yeah, that was that was one of the big appeals. No question. You know, it was a little different. It was a different environment back then, Tommy, as you know, yeah. in the college situation. And these guys now, they have autonomy. They can just pick up and go wherever they want. And, you know, they don't have to sit out or any of that stuff. And, when things kind of fell apart at Union, I was going to transfer over to Cornell, and unfortunately, they 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 fielded a team, and and um, you know I was kind of forced to make a decision. I was hope I was hopeful for the 1980 Olympics. I was going to I was going to give that a go, and uh, would have met Herbie obviously there before I met him in New York, but um, you know I was kind of forced to turn pro, and uh, the Rangers ended up sending me out to Toledo, and then Toledo to New Haven. And that was in uh, 78. We lost in the finals of the Calder Cup there. I was pretty much just, you know, learning from Dougie Sotart, who had a great run in the playoffs. And then the next year was Lindsay and myself. And I think you were there with us in 79. Were you yeah, there? well, and at the, at the end of my college year in 1980, so the 79 and 80 season, once we got done, I went to play in the playoffs at New Haven. That was a great experience, too. Was it Seaweed Petty there, too? See the other uh, I think that was the next year. I oh, think in 1981, they brought Seaweed in. And wow. for a little bit more depth in the organization. That's when we had our training camp in Richmond, Virginia, remember? That's right. Yeah. Well, no, see, my first training camp was the right play map, 1980-81. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, and who was it? Parker Madal, was he coaching? Parker was coaching. We all have Parker stories. <laughs> he would stand in center ice. That's all I can remember. He'd stand in center ice, bully whistle, save drills all the time. Everybody knew what to do, but just line up. 
not a lot of coaching. No, he, no. He, used to, he used to like to jump into the showdown at the end just to see if he couldn't get a uh, free lunch over at the Nords or something. You know? Yeah, we, I'll never forget this. Uh, we had a hard time dumping the puck at, at, in some games or whatever. And he'd measured it. So he obviously knew the rink was, what, 85 feet wide or whatever it is. So now he figured out how many inches was in the 85 feet and how many inches the puck was. He says, okay, so you got like a three-inch puck and you've got whatever number of inches to get the puck in. Can't you get the puck in? Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the most he ever did for coaching. He was a great guy. I don't, I shouldn't bad about that. It's just that's the way coaching was back then, right? Yeah. Remember when he left Frankie Beaton behind in Bingo? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, no, I'll be where I was there then. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. We had just been Bingo in the playoffs. That, that was in 79. So maybe, I don't know if you hadn't joined us yet or what, but uh, we just beaten him and we're on the way to the Calder Cup finals and all that. And, Parker says, you know, we're over to Funzies across the street from the rink to get a right. little bite to eat and a little refreshment. Yeah. And Frank didn't drink at all, as you know. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just sitting there talking and that. And he said, okay, bus leaves at 11. And it's like a four and a half hour run back to the Haven, as you know. And uh, Parker's in his seat and he's like, let's go, bussy. And Buddy Stefanski comes up and he says, Parker, Frank's not on the bus. He goes, bus leaves at 11. See you later. And he takes him up. But he's like pleading with him, like, we're going, to the, we're going to the Calder Cup finals. What are you leaving a guy behind for? So we got all the way up to the highway. He turned it around, came back. Frank was livid. Ooh, I would want to get him back. Parker in that front seat by the tie, and he started giving it to him. Oh, really? And Buddy and a bunch of the guys ran up to break up the fight, and Buddy ended up getting cuffed by Frank in the eye, and he had a nice shiner for the rest of the playoffs. <laughs> and hard luck he related, you know? <laughs> I've never seen that before where a player beats up a coach on the bus. That's funny. Hold on. I got to back up to you. What did you call the bus driver? The bus driver. Yeah. Uh, right. Tom gave me a hard time because I used that phrase before. It's like, yeah, that's just that's that's very condescending. Yeah. But that's, that's the hockey way. It's just, they, I, when you said that to me, I never even thought about it. Well, I guess, it, you know, there's also clubbies. So that's not, uh, a, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm learning. Now that Steve Baker, he basically approved it. I think we're good. I remember yeah, the first time I listen, got you said that. I just remember the guy's name, if you can believe it. Ron oh. Sus. Ron Sus. Sussy and Bussy. <laughs> there you go. Sussy the Bussy. Sounds like a children. Yeah, right Sussy the Bussy. One of the funniest things that I, that I had to get used to when I got on the bus the first time, I think we were going to, I can't remember where we were going. They threw me, you guys threw me off the bus because I didn't have my own cooler of beer, right? The guys would all have their own cooler. They didn't want anybody else touching their beer, so they, they threw me off the bus. <laughs> they, well, it, it was, a, listen, yeah, obviously in college, you're still going out drinking with the guys and all that, but the whole, you know, it was almost like that slap shot feel to it back then, right? In the minors, not the NHL as much, but the one the minors was like, oh, it's fun. Yeah, but I got to tell you, I mean, you didn't you didn't go as low as the eye back then. Yeah, and I was in Toledo, and they had a tough team, man. I mean, I, I won't say goon squad, but I said these guys could play, but they were tougher than nails, and they ended up winning the Turner Cup. And I went back after we lost in the Calder Cup to get a car. Peter Cravel was still there, Maria Gelinato that I played with in college. They were on the club. Michael Rizzioni was there, oh. and uh, they were they were a tough squad. But let me tell you, the IHL back then, yeah. that, yeah. was, that was scary. That was <laughs> scary stuff. I remember Dave Schultz had got sent to the minors, and he's carrying, we're in the New Haven Coliseum, which is gone now, but he's carrying the puck up the ice. And Mike Backman, who's this gritty little guy, he's hacking him in the back of the leg. Out there. Oh. And Schultz turned around and tried to shoot the puck at him, but it was going to, if he missed Backman, it was going to hit our bench. So we're all ducking at the bench. I'm thinking to myself, this is the, this is pro hockey, right? Dave Schultz, yeah. Sorry, so now your first year, so you went to the Myers. Your first year in the NHL was the 80-81 season? Uh, 79-80, when Freddie was, Freddie was there. Right. They called me up They called me up for the Stanley Cup Finals on the taxi squad. And so, you know, now you're a kid, you're sitting up in the stands, and you're going, wow, I want to be part of this. Rangers went down in, I think, uh, five to Montreal. They won the first game of the series and lost four straight. J.D. had the bad knee. Yeah. And then the next year, um, I had a great training camp. That was in Richmond, Virginia. Right. And I remember Danny Summers coming up to me after camp, and he says, Stevie, we know what you've done here. Just go down, keep your nose clean, play well, and uh, you'll be up before you know it. And the Rangers got off to a tough start, and I think I was like, I don't know, 9-1 and one or something down in New Haven. We had a pretty good wagon, as you know, back then. Yeah. And they called me up. So, um, yeah, I was up the rest of the year with them. Very cool. So that my first year is the 81, 80, 81 season. Then you're, you're the goaltender. And JD was still playing at that point, but he was in the lineup all the time, right? Yeah. He had a lot of trouble with his knees. And then he had the sciatica issues that were starting to flare up and he was having trouble. But um, he had, yeah. He had the gin and tonic issue as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he liked to take gray and talk. Oh, a lot of lines. 
Oh, he was a funny man too. He'd go into a bar someplace and there'd be a crowd of people. GD's in the middle there telling little stories. He was that kind of guy. Holding the room, huh? Yeah. Steve, how was it? Because you guys had a lot of goalies then. How was that competition like? Because there was, what, five, six goalies on the Rangers at that time? Yeah, when I when I first, when I was mentioning about the whole thing, when Union kind of fell apart, uh, the Rangers at the time, and that was Fergie because I was drafted by Fergie's regime. And uh, I think 42nd or 44th pick uh, in the third round, which today would be a mid-second rounder, but uh, Bro, they, had, uh, they had under contract at that time. They had Lindsey Middlebrook, they had uh, Hardy Astrom, they had Dougie Sotart, they had Wayne Thomas, and then they had uh, JD. Uh, and so they were like, well, you know, we're not really waiting for you, we're waiting for you after the Olympics. You know, like we're not, we're waiting for you. We're, we're, we kind of got you slotted down the road a little bit. And I'm like, well, you know, I can't go to Cornell. What am I going to do? Sit for the rest of the year? I got to play somewhere. And so they kind of carved out a spot. But yeah, to your point, there were always a lot of bodies around. And then that, that next year, like Tommy mentioned, they brought in Jim Seaweed Petty. And uh, Wayne had retired and became a, an assistant coach. Remember that? Twinkie had become an assistant yeah. coach. Twinkie. Twinkie's a nickname? Yeah, oh, boy. great guy, too. He's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's a weed Twinkie. Seaweed, Twinkie, and Bussy. You guys got all the names there. <laughs> JD. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, be the, so sort of forget, what happened in Union then? Why did you have to leave there? Well, you know, Arctis built that program, and they specifically built a rink on campus. Uh, the guy, I think it was Reverend Achilles from Vermont, who had been on campus for years, donated the money to build a rink, and um, and they picked Ned to come in, uh, Dr. Bonner, who had been at University of New Hampshire. What do you do at University of New Hampshire? They love their hockey up there, right? And uh, so we wanted to build a successful hockey program. And you know what, Tommy, you know, with the small populace like we had at Union, we're only 2,500 undergrad. You can build a successful hockey program rather quickly. And Harkness had done it at RPI, won national championships with them in the 1950s. He's the one that brought that, um, you know, actually built the rink down there. And now uh, an RPI that's still there on the campus. So it was a big airplane hanger up in, up in Canada. He was, a, he was a, a Royal Canadian Air Force guy back in the day. He brought it down and built the rink for them. And then he went over to Cornell and he had similar success, didn't have great success in Detroit as a coach, but he did do a good job in terms of building that program out and doing a lot of, um, you know, unique things for the Red Wings. And they wanted to get back to the college game. So he brought in a very, you know, sound group of players. And um, there was just a lot of nonsense that went on in terms of guys' grades, you know, who's eligible to play, who can't play, who's got scholarship, who's got this, who's got that. And it just got really nasty. And Ned, after our first semester of our junior year, you said, after the Christmas tournament up in Dartmouth, he says, you know what? I'm resigning. And we're like, well, we all came here to play for you. We're the only hockey players on campus. Like, what do we do? There's nobody else that knows anything about hockey in Schenectady, New York. What do we do? And um, and so they failed at a team of, you know, JV guys and that. And it made it a little bit difficult for us. But you know, as life would have it, you find your own way in, and yeah. you know your passion takes over, right? right. I, I forgot about that whole story. And then Harkness was he a good guy? He was a great guy. Oh. I mean, one like one of my great friends and mentors. He died on his 89th birthday, oh. and fortunately, I was able to go up and see him and uh, spend a little bit of time with him uh, before he passed away. About a week or two before he passed away, oh, very cool. Then back for his memorial mass up in uh, Glens Falls, New York. He was just a terrific guy. You would have loved to have played for him, Tommy. Right. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. All right, so we fast forward then. So the 80-81 season, my first year. Did you start the season as the number one goaltender? No. They had sent me back down because they wanted to clean house a little bit on all those extra goaltender contracts they had. They wanted to figure things out. And, you know, Freddie started as the coach, right? Yep. And then yeah. he had some trouble around Christmas, and they brought Craig in, and Craig took over as both coach and GL. Now, and then at that point, Craig said, you know, let's bring Bakes up. And when he did, he demoted Dougie Sotar, which, you know, I, I was like, wow. And then he brought Weeksy in. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, Weeksy had a great career for himself, but uh, it was me and Weeksy going down the stretch there. And he says, here, it's your you shoot your ball. Go with it, man. And we had we had great success. We had a yeah, tough yeah. team. We had a tough team. Yeah, that was a great bunch of guys. Yeah, I remember the big brawl we had in L.A. that – the first series? Oh, man. Well, I don't remember it so much. I've, I've seen the video, but th in that game, if you'll remember, in that first period, I saw like 21 shots, and right. that building was so damn hot, the ice sucked. Yeah. And the, you remember, the goaltender goes off right at the back at the end of the first period, right behind the net. Right. 
And so I just figured, you know, okay, the period's over. I was cramping like a barber. I just want to get down to the room and get some yeah. water in that. And I'm sitting there and I'm sitting there and I'm going, where the hell are the guys? And you guys are out there calling the shit out of them. So I'm saying, that's fine by me. Yeah. You, know? you, you made the right move. Yeah. You didn't want to be in that. That was blast. Yeah. Tom was out there crying. It's a great picture. That's all on my It's a picture. <laughs> I me, mean, I've got this like really, I think it's this intense face, but it looks like I'm crying. It looks like he's crying yeah. while Marcel Dion's getting pummeled. Yeah. And I think it was Nitty Hawk, but our like yeah. dopes, Marcel or something. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Remember yeah. Nikki, there's the, the video too. Nikki, Nikki coming down, watch the, the video. He's he's not dressed. He's in uh, plain clothes. And somebody had grabbed Eddie Hosper from behind. I think it was a, a player for LA that was not dressed. And Nikki comes flying down. <laughs> he's grabbing the guy, ragdolling on the bench. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, you wanted Nikki in your foxhole. And he oh, tries to you know, all right. So now you and you and you went with the, the whole playoffs, right? Till we got done with the Islanders. Yeah, yeah. We had uh, we were ten and three, yeah. or or well, seven and three in the first uh, two yep. for the first two series, and then yep. next thing you know, we're fourteenth place finish. Remember the old line: everybody makes the playoffs in the yep. uh, NHL because we're only twenty one teams in the league. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we finished fourteenth out of sixteen that made it. Next thing you know, we're standing there in the semifinals. At Defending Stanley Cup champion Islanders, who were just a machine. Yeah, they were really a machine. I, I think yeah. we respected them too much, too. Don't you think? Like, the way we played against LA and St. Louis was nasty, dirty, beating them up and everything. Then we got the Islanders, and we just like, I think we were in awe of them a little bit. I, that's how I like I would agree with that. My, my biggest regret in my life is that I never got a chance to go back in against them again because I tore my groin early in the next season, as you know, with Herb, and that was yeah. the beginning of the end. And uh, kind of got a little bit blackballed, but it is what it is, right? So, yeah. Do you think Herb blackballed you? No, no. I just think, I think overall in the league, like oh, you know, okay. he's damaged goods, you know, oh, I mean, okay. pretty severe tear, right? Like you right. tore up right. rectus abdominis and, and you made your groin muscle. I know, listen, a groin pull, a severe groin issue for a forward or a defenseman's bad yeah. enough, yeah. but for a goaltender, it's like, yeah, when's that kind of goal again? You and you're a big man too. Oh, totally. Like 6'4"? How tall are you? Yeah, it's like six, three. And shrinking. <laughs> you know how that works. Get older. I try to fight it. I try to fight it. So, Steve, a lot of people ask about, about your mask and the designer because it's kind of iconic. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, I, I had a, had a Higgins a mask, you know, because growing up in Boston, Ernie was there in, in, um, in Norwood, Mass. And like a lot of people, I had a Higgins. He was kind of like the standard bearer at the time. And then uh, Ken Dryden's brother, Dave, was starting to get into that a little bit. And then a guy by the name of Greg Harrison up in Toronto was doing a lot of it. And I was up in Toronto, um, I think it was at the end of my first year with the Rangers, and I said, you know what, let me go up and see Greg and see if he can't take a mold and get a mask made up there. And then we talked after we did the mold, and he said, you know, what do you want to put on it? And I said, well, something in Rangers, red, white, and blue, but, you know, something that speaks to the city. You know, that would be nice. And so I can't take full credit other than kind of giving him a little bit of guidance. And he was a great artist, and he came back with the Empire State Building, you know, up the middle and a star on either cheek and a star over the top and Rangers red, white, and blue colors. And I'll tell you, it's funny. Remember Roger Bear at the time, Tony, you might remember, he used to do the interviews at ringside before the games. That's right. And Rocky's down there, God bless him. And he's down, and he sees me skating around with the mask, and he goes, Pixie, come over here, come over here, come over here. So I come over and go, Rocky, what's up? And he goes, what is that thing on your mask? Is Steve Abernathy? He says, is that an Alex symbol or something? <laughs> I've got a tail fire snake building, Rocky. <laughs> oh, he's funny. <laughs> he's such a funny man. We blasted Roger Bever. He was such a funny guy. We'd play charity games or whatever, and he'd be talking to the other team. And I'd come by, and i go, listen, I'll translate for you guys later. <laughs> yeah, we're going to say he's a fun man, though. He was good. It is interesting, right? You look back at the game and all the great people you met uh, playing college and pro, so pretty cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, uh, it was the time of my life. Yeah. And, you know, even to this day, I mean, I, you know, had my real job after I, um, you know, transitioned, um, got into the media and sports marketing business. I've been an executive in that space over 30 years, but I got a call from Phil and Tony because I played with Phil, uh, of course, in New York and Tony uh, with Team USA and the Canada Cup were partners. And they said, Bakes, we don't have anybody up in the, they, you know, started the the, uh, the uh, Tampa organization. We don't have anybody up in the New England area, Bird Dog, and he yeah, interested. Well, the traffic is so bad, man. So I figured, you know, by the time I leave the ranks at 915, it would be a half hour run home instead of an hour and 45 minute run. And I started that. And 16 years later, I near put myself in an early grade working my real job and that job on top of it. But uh, we ended up winning a cup in 2004. 
I got a cup ring, got my name on the cup, got a day with the cup. I mean, you know, those are wonderful surprises in life, you know? Oh, that's very cool. I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah, I'm jealous. As you do a yeah. day with the cup, that'd be fun. All right, so like, uh, go back to when you pulled your groin or tore your groin. So did you go to any other organizations or you just stayed with the Rangers? No, I, that year, the rest of that year, I just rehabbed. And then towards the end of the year, our farm club was in Springfield. And so I'd been off, off the ice, you know, for so long. And I'm like, listen, I gotta, I gotta get back in. And Craig's like, well, do you think you can do it? And I'm like, I gotta give it a try sometime. So he sent me down to Springy and they were in a run for, you know, a playoff spot. So the guys were serious and all that stuff. They wanted to make the playoffs. I don't think, I don't think they did, but you know, they had a couple other goalkeepers there. And uh, I think it might've been Seaweed and it might've been Rick Strack, maybe back at the time. Rick Strack, wow. And, and so they threw me into some games. I made a, may have played a handful of games, probably didn't play very well. Uh, and then went home for the summer and just really, really worked hard on getting in shape again. Um, and they sent me out to, uh, uh, out to Tulsa, which in the central hockey league was their farm club that next year. And they said, just go play and play a lot. And I ended up playing like 56 games, most in the league. Uh, they did bring me up, Tommy, you might remember for a short period of time, um, you know, I think it was on a West Coast swing. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. played it maybe I played against Edmonton. I think we lost two one with a late power play goal. And I, I came in and relieved Eddie Mio uh in Vancouver after a bad first period he had and then, you know, played the back back two. We ended up losing that. But um, you know, Eddie was the guy that year. And yeah. they brought me up for the taxi squad and at the end of that season it's like, you know, you know, let's let's agree to agree to to separate. And so I kind of found myself on the outside looking in. I ended up going to Boston's camp, and uh, they had Pete Peters, who, of course, was going to play 60, 65 games. And they had Dougie Keynes, who was, um, I think, the uh, Tom Johnson's uh, godson as the backup that came in from L.A. Uh, so that was kind of the fix was in. And then I'm like, okay, well, where do I go now? Then I ended up in bingo with the Whalers for a short period of time. And then the next thing you know, uh, Maine needed some help. And so I went up to Maine, and uh, we had a bunch of guys that had played in the NHL that were kind of on the ends of their careers. And they said, you know, we're a fourth-place finisher in the league. And we're like, let's let's really suck it up, get in the playoffs, and do something here. And we ended up, you know, Gary Howe was our captain. He, you know, he said Dennis Poffin never let him carry the Stanley Cup around. So we ended up winning the Calder Cup. And so I went out a champion. I walked across the ice out in Roch. War Memorial and walked across to the pay phones, called the wife. And I said, that's it. You know, seven years of fun and games. I had a wife and two kids. It was time to get busy and figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. You know? So how are you feeling at that point? I mean, you had that great run in 80, 81 in the playoffs uh, well, for the whole season, but for the playoffs in particular. And then uh, all of a sudden you're going through all these problems with the groin and going down the minors. Were you like mad at yourself, mad at other people? That's just the way it was. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, uh, everybody gets handed different cards and you got to just deal with what you got, right? What you got in your hand. And, um, you know, I, I made a mistake. I had actually kind of hurt my groin a little bit um, against Grand Fury's first trip to to uh, the Garden. Uh, we played the Oilers and uh, I know we we're up 2 nothing. I think we ended up with the game 4-2. to two. Uh, But at any rate, um, I, I knew that next day, like we're, we – we were going to head to Boston. My groin was bothering me a little bit. And Weeksy was my was my, my my backup guy, right? And remember the old line, like you never, you never, you know, give a rookie a start in Boston. It was such a tough building to play in. And so I almost felt like, you know, I had to play. And sure enough, I get out there, you know, after warming up, I could feel hydrocolator packs. It was bothering me a little bit. And then Tommy Fergus came in and just ripped one to my low stick side. And I went full blast, you know, split kick. And that left groin, which was the, uh, where your weight bearing just totally just popped and just tore right off, you know? Wow. So. All right. So the game is done then. Uh, and then what career did you get going after that? I got into media and sports marketing business. Uh, went back to school, got my BA in economics and oh, great. Uh, finished that up. Cause I had chipped away at it when I was in New York at, uh, at university of New Haven and Manhattanville when I was up in the New York area during the summer months. Right. So I chipped away. I was able to do it, finish it up in a year, get my dissertation and all that stuff done. And um, and then I started looking around. The first job offer I got was with Chase Manhattan Bank in New York and their marketing department. And I'm like, eh, do I want to get into a high rise, strap hanging into the city every day, 
four walls and a computer terminal drive me absolutely insane. I like to talk to people. I like to be out and about. And then I got an opportunity with CBS. And I'm like, hmm, that sounds more appealing to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. media world, sell, selling spots and dots and sponsorships and all that good stuff. And, um, you know, I had some great mentors that I worked for over the course of time and and uh, worked for the Dolans for, for 10 years, built, uh, built out a number of stations and rep firms for them. And then when they merged together, their Rainbow Sports Organization with with Fox Sports, uh, Rupert Murdoch's group, um, I jumped over with Rupert and worked for him for 11 years, building out their national rep, which we built into a billion dollar company. So, yeah. Very cool. So, you know, I, I really admire you. Other guys have done, Dave Maloney has done it, other players as well. But going back to school and get, get your degree, like I didn't do that. I jumped right into it, a career. And I, I look back at it and I wish I had it. Uh, that's pretty cool. I like that. I admire you a lot for that. And now I'll use it. Oh, sorry. Take that compliment. Sorry. Please, Steve, take that compliment from Tommy. He doesn't give him out too often. Awesome. Yeah, no, listen, I, I, I give Tommy high grades, man. I mean, you know, he never asked for anything from anybody. And he's been a you know, self-made man in terms of, you know, how he's gone about handling his life. And he's always trying new things. And, you know, obviously uh, made us all look good on Survivor. Uh, guys, of our genre. And he uh, showed us that we can still get out there and make it happen. And uh, look at him now. I mean, he's got his own podcast. It's, it's successful and still involved with the Rangers uh, Alumni Association and working with the kids, hockey in Harlem and all that good stuff. I mean, he's a he's a, a renaissance man. Thanks, Vicks. Wow. Terry, yeah. Terry Ryan, the old player, has got a podcast. He called me a renaissance man, too. And it, when he said that to me first, like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, first he said, what is renaissance? Well, I did have to look it up. Yeah. We were renaissance was, yeah. Um, all right, so you've got that career going. Now they've got a new league. You and St. Patrick are working together, correct? The three ice no, that, that, that was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, again, surprises in life, right? Yeah. Um, I had just finished doing a startup out in Austin, Texas, and then we moved up to the Scottsdale area, like I mentioned. Now I was working for a media company here, pretty comfortable. And then uh, a young man that I identified as a solid talent coming out of Penn State, E.J. Johnson uh, Jr. You remember his dad, E.J., the goalkeeper and general manager, and you know, obviously drafted Mario number one overall. Made a great pick there, yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, just a terrific gentleman. And uh, his son was uh, working for an advertising agency in Boston. I'm like, man, you got to come over here and work on our side of the equation with Fox Sports. And we brought him over, and he was very, very successful. And then we kind of lose you, you lose each other after a period of time, right? He went on to great things, uh, and then we kind of got back together, and he. Threw the idea out of me, uh, had a beer together out in Scottsdale, Arizona back in 2018, 19, in that era. And he said, you know, what do you, what do you think about this? And I, you know, I'd been scouting for so long and I know a lot of the rookie camps had gone in the three on three place. So they could look at the speed and the skill and the stretch passes and all that great stuff, you know, open ice, et cetera. And I said, you know, I think you have something here and I'd be willing to work with you on it. So we all rolled up our sleeves, put together our guiding coalition. Another gentleman that I brought in the business uh, years ago that was a terrific talent, had his own advertising agency. He just sold it, so the timing was good. We brought him in, and we brought Craig in as our commissioner. So we had that hockey piece you know, covered, and uh, we've just put this thing together, and it's just been gangbusters, Tommy, the last two years. We just finished our second wow. year. Yeah. And it's going well? Yeah, three ice, it's called. Yep. And it's three-on-three three hockey, uh, overtime all the time. Uh, it's what Greg had tagged it. And, uh, you know, we've got seven players a team. We've got eight teams now in the league. They're all run by uh, Hall of Fame coaches. So these players that come in, you know, whether they're, you know, just out of college, most of the guys are a lot of guys that are playing over in Europe that have had maybe some NHL or AHL experience. We have had some guys that are, you know, former NHLers. I think last year we had maybe 30% of our players with NHL experience, and we'll probably balloon up to like 40, 50 this year. It's just been so well received. The guys get taken care of soup to nuts. And uh, you come in and you play in a tournament format. We bring in uh, four teams in each each of the uh, seven weeks during the course. Of, well, actually, it's going to be eight weeks next year and then a playoffs uh, championship. But they come in and they'll play, you know, two games. Winners advance to a championship. And then we have a consolation game as well. So you, you buy a ticket of three ice, you're going to see four games over a two-hour period. And um, the guys are playing for money. It's like the PGA Tour. So they're they they're hepped up and excited, you know, each and every time that they step on the ice, there's money at stake. That's cool. Uh, and it's on TV as well, right? Yeah, we've got uh, we've got a contract. Uh, we did a four year deal with CBS, so CBS Sportsnet and CBS. Our championships are on CBS proper. 
Um, um, and uh, that was in Philly on August 12th. We wrapped up our second season in Wells Fargo, which is a great building and a great venue. And um, and we only played, last year we played uh, seven games. Next year we'll ramp back up to nine games. It was kind of a crazy economy, as you know, coming out of COVID. So we had to kind of right-size the business for the year. Wow. You mentioned Craig Patrick there. What a great guy, too. So we had our Ranger Golf uh, Tournament here recently, and Craig got honored uh, at the golf tournament. It rained the whole day, so it kind of... <laughs> A little bit of a damper on the golf, but yeah, still good. He was a funny. I liked him a lot. He was a great guy. He, man, he was a good general manager too. Like what he did there in Pittsburgh, in particular, to bring in Scotty Bowman and uh, Badger Bob Johnson. Man, that's that's kind of a courageous thing to do, right? To bring in those guys. So, yeah, yeah, you know what? I, I, you know, honestly, I give him full marks for that. And it's funny, Tommy. I was just watching last last week. I'm having coffee early in the morning, like six thirty. Got the NHL Network on, and they're showing the ninety one game that they wrapped up against Minnesota North Stars. Yeah, yeah. They won eight to nothing. And I looked at the team and everybody that he had affiliated on the, from assistant coaches to you guys, you know, consulting, et cetera. I mean, it's, I said, Craig, you put together a wagon. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, oh, it was fun. And I'm like, man, you're too humble. You're too humble. That was a wagon and a half you put together there. You know, for Fred, you know this too. Like, it was a brave move too, because look, a lot of times you look at those guys, they're going to steal your job. I mean, like, Craig's this mild mannered guy, like Scotty Bowman, you know, he's fire and brimstone, Bob, Bob Johnson, the same way. But he said, nope, this is how we're going to win. Put a fantastic staff together, and he did it. So, oh, yeah, cool. absolutely. I think he was the exec in the year of the NHL like three three times. Yeah. Don't know. I think he was the only general manager in Ranger history to never miss the playoffs when he was here as a general manager. Yeah. He coached too. He, he was good. Like him for him to take over the team halfway through my first year, like he handled it well. But he really didn't have any head coaching experience. I don't think did he at all. He was not a general manager in the league, and he did it all. So he's good. Yeah, well, you know, like with with Herb, you know how Herb, you know, went about his business, right? Yeah, and yeah. With, especially with the AD team, I mean, it's all well documented. But Craig was the communicator. He was the glue in the mix between Herb and and the players. And he always had that same kind of way about him. You know, he was always approachable. Yeah. Always easy to chat with and uh, and and sensical. Like he never got worked up to the point where it's like you know oh, I'm in trouble. Yeah, well, right. you know, yeah. Really, the only emotion he showed, and I've told the story before, he would cry sometimes in meetings. Like he was so emotional, and cared about the team so much, he would get emotional and cry. And I loved it. I thought it was just great. Now for other guys, it was kind of like, oh, come on, it's kind of weak, you know. But hey, he's fantastic. Great memories with him. Yeah. Well, this is a big. Uh, you know what? Thank you very much for coming on the show. Your stories are fantastic. Yeah, story. Uh, really good. You've got, you've got, you know what I like about it too is that you've done as well after the game as you did dur during the game too. You, you just didn't say, okay, I'm a former NHL hockey player. You really went after it, did other things you like. So that's kudos to you. Well, I thank you for that. And uh, it's always about hard work, right, Tommy? Yeah, it's totally. got to come you unless you put your head down and you, you dig in, jump into your coat of armor and get at it every day. Yeah, well, I get it. you're a great example too. We're listening. Something's going to go wrong. Things always go wrong. You make mistakes, you do bad things. Uh, you know, life isn't fair. But it's what you do after, right? And you're a good example of that. It was all yep. so great to see you again. How's your wonderful wife doing too? By the way, she's a sweetheart. Oh, she she's doing great. She's doing great. She's actually hanging out. She's still uh, working, um, and I think she's thinking about making that 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 change pretty soon. Now, probably within the next year or so. But uh, she's doing terrific, and she's got three grandkids to keep her busy now. So she's happy about that. There you yeah, go. good job. Great to see you again, Bakes. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks, Dave. thanks, thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. See you all. I knew we body lad. Why? Why? What's with the pirate stuff? You were it, well, this combination with a Irish. It's an Irish pirate. Irish pirate. Um, I guess they had. Not many people can do that. Like they combine two things, like an Irish pirate. Why don't you combine something that's more difficult? Like you know, we body lad. Yeah, we. How, yeah. how about like a, a, a Colombian Scotsman in here? <laughs> Just tell me, we body lad was a well, small, we small bonnie pretty lad boy. She's a we body lass yeah. is a, a no, small. You were we. This, this everyone knows this guy's such a high bully. God, six two. You know, I wonder if anyone who was the tallest guy you played with. Oh, Willie Huber probably. So he's like what six five, six four, six five. Did he look down on anybody? No, because he, he's not a, he's not a bully like you. Jeff, but you know that deep down that just loved. It's just I don't know about that. Ooh, you, look, you played with Mark Pavlich, who was what five seven. You played Mike Rogers five six, five seven. Richard Rivers so was he five eight yeah, maybe. So he's just, he's played with the Smurfs, Rob McClanahan, another small one. He, but he was actually, you know what though? He, uh, he was like he's like five eleven. Is that Rob McClanahan? Was he always oh, that? He just well, 
Yeah, and because he played, I think he, he was part of that whole group that Herb brought in. Right. And he and he got famously berated in the uh, the movie. His character did. Yes, yes. I'll tell you, he competed hard, though. For sure. All those guys did. Yeah. Steve Baker was another guy. No. Uh, yeah. Billy Baker. Oh, Bill Baker, the dentist. Uh, Dave Silk, your buddy, yeah. your running buddy from back in the day. Oh, God. Some of the Silky, a big guy? Uh, no, he's probably six feet. Oh, so yeah. that's, that's a year. That's okay for you. You know, it's, you know, it's funny. You get together with those guys and there's all these stories and you, they're in your mind. But you think, okay, did it really happen that way? Yeah. So can I talk to each other a couple of years ago? We started telling some little stuff. But also the Ukraine, it's like, oh, I don't want to really bring this up again. We did this back yeah, then. You know what though? I, I it's so long, so long ago. Like even the story I tell about like getting cut from the like, hey, let me think. I didn't tell that story for years until right. I said once I, I got into all the true good life and motivation and everything, I've got to share I said, I got to share this story. Well, I, I you know, I play a lot of sport around there. Let's see, you have a good story about sport around there, right? Oh, maybe, well, maybe, yeah. another, maybe another show we'll tell that one. Yeah, we were learning to play racquetball there. Legendary barn in uh, Rockland County. So that, I'm going to have now, Pop is losing his mind. I just, oh, so, as Tom gave me COVID. Okay, okay. so I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to be producer and star. There, the show. there you go. All right, so. Well, what a great talk with your ex teammate there, Steve Baker. What a smart guy. I know, right? Isn't it funny that we've told that story about him? Uh, coming in to call his father, Dr. Baker, it shouldn't be a big deal. We, we as mud heads. But you knuckleheads jumped on it. So, yeah, so it carried on for decades. My, I called my father Chief Laidlaw. Right, so your dad was Chief Laidlaw. Mike Rogers was coffin maker. What was like uh, Barry Beck's dad? Oh, I can't remember. I did. It's so funny. I mean, we were, and again, we thought this was just the most hilarious thing right. in the world, right? Back then. So. Your inside jokes. Yeah. You know. so, and so people, well, we tell a story in the show. Yeah, right? we, did. we did. We just told it. Right. And they'll hear it. Well, I could tell it. But we heard it was a great, great talk with Stephen. He's he's had such a great career after, yeah, uh, after hockey. So to- totally admire that. There wasn't many guys like I've talked about Dave Maloney in the past. Yeah, other guys have done it. John Tonelli did it. Uh, yep. Uh, but to to co- uh, finish the game and go complete your education or get your education while you're still playing and then have a good career after. Yeah. And then on top of that, he said he was working two jobs. He's working for the Lightning. Yeah. And then he was doing he was a CBS account exec. Yeah. So he had he had a lot going on. And he's in that three ice business now. Well, now he's after ice cream, which is a really exciting gig. So it was great to have him on. Uh, what a great I, I, I do remember he just like again he was kind of stood out because he was such an intelligent yeah. guy and, so, and he still has that distinguished gentleman look like you, you see that say you know say he was, it was a good great great guy great show yeah, thanks good. for thanks for listening yes like we bought a lot oh boy all right grasshoppers thank you for listening we had a fantastic show we'll see you next time